The Holy See slaps back at an outspoken Chinese cardinal and critic of the Vatican-China deal. But why? Asia expert and president of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosier, joins us with analysis. And the Vatican has opened its Pius XII archives early. What new information might be discovered about the wartime pope's activities? President of the Pave the Way Foundation, Gary Krupp, is here to tell us. She's a pro-life Democrat and author of a new pro-life law central to a case now before the U.S. Supreme Court. Louisiana State Senator Katrina Jackson is here with an update. And what can we do to get the most out of our Lent and Easter this year? Father Bill Saunders is here to tell us how to celebrate a holy Catholic Easter. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. A great show for you tonight. Steve Mosier, Gary Krupp, Katrina Jackson, and Father William Saunders are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. First, some news. Catholic bishops in Germany on Tuesday chose a new leader. With a challenging agenda, including controversial reform proposals and compensation demands from sex abuse victims, Bishop of Limburg, George Betzing, has openly expressed support for the German synodal path and the need to restore the credibility of the Catholic Church in Germany. Betzing replaces Cardinal Reinhard Marx, also considered a liberal, who announced his retirement last month. On Tuesday, the Vatican sought to end the speculation that Pope Francis might have contracted the coronavirus following nearly a week of concern about the Pope's health amid the epidemic spread in Italy. Quote, the Holy Father's cold, diagnosed in recent days, is running its course without symptoms attributable to other pathologies, the Vatican spokesman Matteo Bruni said. Mr. Bruni was responding to an Italian media report that the Pope had been tested last week for the coronavirus with a negative result. In Italy, the government announced that schools will close until mid-March. Italy's Tourism Federation said up to 90 percent of hotel and travel agency bookings for March have been canceled in Rome and up to 80 percent in Sicily. And the streets are completely deserted. Palestinian officials, meanwhile, on Thursday announced that the Church of the Nativity in the biblical city of Bethlehem will be closed indefinitely over fears of the new coronavirus weeks ahead of the busy Easter holiday season. And a high-ranking Vatican official is taking retired Hong Kong Cardinal Joseph Zen to task this week. The newly appointed dean of the College of Cardinals, Giovanni Baptista Rey, said in a letter to the full college, he claims that the Vatican-China deal represents policy that both St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI supported. And he attacks Zen for his vocal opposition to the deal, particularly Zen's letter to the College of Cardinals in September of 2019, decrying the agreement. More on this with my next guest. Joining me now with an update on what's really happening to Christians in communist China under the Vatican agreement and the dissension in the Vatican and more is the president of the Population Research Institute, author of The Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier, who joins us from Florida. Steve, thanks for being here. Good to be here. Uh, I, I want to start, Steve, with the Cardinal Ray letter that I just mentioned. In writing about Pope Francis's predecessors, Cardinal Ray says the following, quote, I desire, first of all, to emphasize that in their approach to the situation of the Catholic Church in China, there is a profound symphony of thought and of the action of the last three pontificates, which out of respect for the truth have favored dialogue between two parties, not opposition. Cardinal Ray then launches a direct attack against Cardinal Zen, writing, on various occasions, Zen has declared that it would have been better to have no agreement than a bad agreement. The last three popes did not share this position and supported and accompanied the drafting of the agreement that at the present time seemed to be the only one possible, end quote. Is, if this is true, why wasn't an agreement with China signed 
by John Paul II or Benedict XVI, Steve? I mean, the climate in China hasn't changed. Well, the, the climate in China actually has changed. It's gotten a lot worse over the last few years, especially under President for Life Xi Jinping. But anyone who's familiar with the pontificate of St. John Paul II knows that he was not a fan of Ostpolitik. In fact, his approach mm -hmm. was precisely the opposite of Ostpolitik. He was not interested in placating the Eastern European communist regimes. On his trip to, to Poland, of course, he told a million Poles, be not afraid, several times. And, of course, they took that to mean that they should seize control of their lives again and, and wrest it away from the communist dictatorship that they had been laboring under for decades. So he was not a fan of, of Ostpolitik at all. This deal, uh, we understand, has been something that the Chinese Communist Party has put forward for a long, long time. It was not accepted. Uh, by Pope John Paul II. And I believe uh, Pope Benedict has made it clear in interviews that, uh, that he uh, was not a fan of the deal either, that he did not accept the deal. Now, I realize that Cardinal Ray puts a different spin on it, mm -hmm. but Cardinal Zen himself has said uh, he knows that Pope Benedict was not uh, in favor of this deal. This is a long-standing proposal on the part of the Chinese Communist Party for the Vatican basically to consent to its control of Catholicism in China. Uh, that's why it was rejected by the two previous popes. And I find it somewhat disingenuous that, that Cardinal Ray tries to use the borrowed authority of two popes, who, mm -hmm. well, one of whom can't speak out on this issue because he's gone to his reward, and the other of whom probably won't either, uh, out of respect for the current, the current pope. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a complete misrepresentation of, of uh, the position of the previous two popes. Yeah, well, Cardinal Zen, in his letter back to Ray, he quotes an interview, which you referenced, to, uh, from Benedict XVI, talking about his view of communism that he shared with John Paul. At the end, he says, obviously, nobody could expect the communism in Europe would collapse so soon. But anyway, instead of being conciliatory and accepting compromises, it was necessary to resist it forcefully. That was the fundamental vision of John Paul II, which I shared. Now, I recently interviewed Cardinal Zen. This is what he had to say about the current climate in China and how the Vatican-China deal contributed to what we're seeing there. Watch. I'm very, very sad to say that uh, all this happened uh, also because of the wrong policy in the Vatican, you see? Mm. Because uh, they, they have done everything to, 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 to give the, uh, uh, the church into the hands of, of the enemy. Mm. You see, the first act is that so-called uh, secret agreement. Right. The second act is to legitimize the seven bishops. Uh, the seven bishops who were excommunicated and part of yeah. the government-run church. Now they're legitimized. They've been brought in. They've been the, the excommunications have been lifted. They are now the legitimate bishops in the land. And uh, and uh, 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 in the meantime, they have uh, uh, told the two legitimate bishops to step down. The last act, even even more terrible, mm -hmm. uh, the Holy See has encouraged everybody to join the political association to come into the open and to obey the government. The encouragement uh, there, Steve Mosier, by the Vatican for Chinese Catholics to leave the underground church and join the Patriotic Association run by the government, isn't that what's hurt these Chinese Catholics the most? And isn't this just what the Xi regime wanted? Well, it is, because the Patriotic Association is a schismatic organization, not, obviously not uh, even, even a, a bishop's uh, uh, organization of bishops. It's, it's controlled by the Communist Party directly through the United Front Department. It includes representatives chosen by the Communist Party of the laity uh, and, and other people associated with church organizations in China. So it's not just the bishops themselves. Mm. But the other thing I would say about the agreement is it's going to expire uh, in September. On September 22nd, this is a provisional agreement. The secret agreement was only supposed to run for two years. Uh -huh. And, you know, by your fruits, by their fruits, you will know them. What have been the fruits of this agreement? Uh, has the Vatican got any one of the 40 
uh, bishop candidates that it selected in years past to be elevated uh, to the episcopate. Ha has the Communist Party agreed to advance the names of even one? The answer is no. The Communist Party got everything it wanted. It got the seven illegitimate bishops legitimized. It managed to have the two bishops who were staunch in opposition to the party deposed. And, and what has the Catholic Church gotten in return uh, from the Chinese Communist Party? Effectively, uh, nothing. Uh, Cardinal Perlin has said over and over again, we must give the agreement time. Actually, time is not on the side of the Catholic Church in China. Uh, time is running out. Yeah. I want to play for you the Pope's prayer intention for the month. Now, he video recorded this, so this is the message. Watch. The Church wants Chinese Christians to be truly Christians and be good citizens. They should promote the gospel, but without engaging in proselytism. And they need to achieve unity of the divided Catholic community. Steve Mosier, how is that received by the faithful in China, do you think? Well, the underground church, of course, has, has been in hiding from the authorities now since 1958. Many have spent decades in prison. And, and for them to be told they must now sign an agreement to join the Patriotic Church requires them to violate uh, their conscience. Now, the pastoral guidelines that were issued last summer do say that anyone who has a conscientious objection to signing the new uh, uh, agreement to join the Patriotic Church uh, should, should refuse to do so. But there are consequences for refusing to do so, especially if you're in the position of seeming to oppose the Catholic Church itself in, in your resistance to signing the document. The Catholics in China and the underground church have been put in a, a terrible position. Mm. And don't forget that even those faithful Catholics in the Patriotic Church, and there are some faithful Catholic priests and, and, and laity, uh, are now under increasing pressure. You cannot bring your own children to Mass with you. Catechism classes have been canceled. Uh, summer camps have been canceled. The Church cannot engage in any activities, even helping people in the the, the coronavirus-struck areas of China. The Church mm -hmm. has been forbidden to engage in charitable acts there. They want to confine Catholics to the buildings uh, owned by the Catholic Church, although some of those are being torn down, and they want to prevent the faith from spreading. So for um, anyone in the Vatican to say, don't engage in proselytization, um, that, that's pretty much forbidden in China anyway by wow. the authorities. And to be a good citizen, which basically means follow your masters, follow the ma follow Xi and what's being laid out for you, and just keep your head down. I mean, that's really what's being prayed for there. Yeah, and it's really a complete under misunderstanding of the political situation in China because under the Chinese Communist Party, in China it is politics first, last, and always. So that when you're a good citizen in the United States, that means you vote, right? You educate mm -hmm. yourself on issues. Uh, you vote for candidates who support your, your position on the issues. In China, it means you support the Chinese Communist Party and its core leader, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping. He's known as the people's leader in China now. That's another title he's appropriated from the late chairman Mao Zedong. And he wants everyone's loyalty. In China, you have to download a study, Xi Jinping's thought app on your phone and study it every day for 20 minutes and answer questions about what you've studied just to show mm -hmm. that you're, 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 you're showing proper allegiance to and understanding the thought of great leader Xi Jinping. Chinese wow. Catholics have been told not to read the Bible because everything that's good and beautiful and true comes from the Chinese Communist Party. So they should put their Bibles aside, study Xi Jinping on their iPhones, and, and answer the questions and be good citizens of, of China. Mm. Scary. Uh, your thoughts on Ray's, Cardinal Ray's insistence that Benedict XVI allegedly approved this agreement. Cardinal Zen challenged him on that. Um, do, do you believe that, that he could have ever embraced something like this, given the letter that Benedict himself wrote in the early 2000s to the Chinese church? Well, let me go back to something Cardinal Perlin told me uh, a little over a year ago. He said, uh, the agreement is already finalized. We're just waiting for the Chinese side to come over and sign it. Now, I believe that has been the Chinese Communist Party's proposal for a long, long time, over a decade. If Pope Benedict actually was ready to approve the agreement, uh, there were no obstacles to him doing that back in 2010.
mm -hmm. uh, or 2012. He didn't do it. What does that tell you, Raymond? Mm. Yeah, well, Cardinal, you know, Cardinal Zen, when he sat here on my set, he insisted that the Holy Father was being manipulated. He blamed Cardinal Parolin. Do you see truth in that statement? Uh, Raymond, I, I really have no way to judge the relationship between the Cardinal Secretary of State and Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. I know that Pope Francis, like every pope going back to probably uh, St. Peter, was eager to evangelize the East, and it is a, a, a lacuna, it is a, it is a gap in our evangelization that we have not been able to reach China mm -hmm. uh, in a big way over the centuries. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that that, that hope uh, burns in, in Pope Francis's heart as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but for someone to represent to him that this agreement uh, marks progress towards that goal is, is absolutely false and a misrepresentation of the real situation on the ground in China, which is, as I say, getting worse by the day, not better. Yeah, I was struck that they would attack Zen in such a, a, a visible way. But, um, you know, this is hardball, and no dissent will be allowed, apparently, about this secret agreement that not even Zen or any Chinese bishop has been allowed to see. Uh, moving on to another topic, dealing with China, one you've been writing about in recent days, the coronavirus. Now, you claim in a recent article that you believe the virus escaped from the National Biosafety Laboratory, part of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. How did you come to that? Well, uh, I connected the dots, um, and, and, and the dots begin with this. We know that China is a signatory to the 1972 Bioweapons Convention. We know that it has been violating that convention ever since the ink was dry on that document. So they do have an actual bioweapons program. As part of that program, they've been collecting dangerous viruses, including coronaviruses, from animals and from around the world. Mm -hmm. There have actually been instances in North America, in a Canadian lab and in American labs, of, of coronavirus samples being stolen and spirited back to China. Where are those pathogens, those dangerous pathogens, being collected and studied? They're being collected and studied in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It is the only level four lab in China. There's a level three near Beijing. This is the only level four, the highest uh, level of containment of dangerous pathogens supposedly exists in Wuhan. Now, we know that there have been uh, viruses, dangerous pathogens that have escaped from Chinese bio labs before. There were SARS, there was a SARS epidemic back in 2003, and then two more epidemics in 2004. Why? Because the SARS virus escaped from the lab in Beijing and caused deaths and, and many illnesses in China. So we know that the lab protocols are weak. Uh, we also know that, uh, that, that in the case of the epidemic, the beginning of the epidemic, the very epicenter of the epidemic is in the city of Wuhan, right. only a few miles from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. China is a big country, Raymond. Mm. There are three million square miles almost. If it passed innocently from an animal to a human somewhere in China, it probably would have happened in Xinjiang or Tibet or Manchuria or somewhere else. Right. Why did it happen right next door to the Institute of Virology mm. in Wuhan? Probably because it escaped from the lab there. Wow. Now, the Chinese pointed to snakes and bats uh, not far from that lab and uh, some scaly anteater as the uh, origin of this coronavirus. Uh, do you believe the Chinese story? And what do you make of the World Health Organization numbers and reportage on this particular virus and its spread? Well, I believe that the, the virologists who are working in the bioweapons program of the People's Liberation Army at the Institute of Virology were collecting uh, coronaviruses from, from all different kinds of animals. They were not only stealing them from labs overseas, they were collecting them from a little scaly anteaters called pangolins. They were mm -hmm. collecting them from bats and, and other animals, looking to see uh, which, which, which uh, coronaviruses would be most effective. But I believe that the virus, whether it began in a bat or not, uh, it ended up in a laboratory, the laboratory in Wuhan, from which it escaped. Now, the other thing that, that, that you can say about a possible vector is this. Uh, there are credible reports. In fact, there are people in prison now, researchers in prison in China now, because they, after experimenting on their lab animals, they sold the lab animals on the local fresh meat market. Mm. Now, let me repeat that. Researchers in China have been accused of, after experimenting with their lab animals, taking those same lab animals, rats or bats or pangolins, and then selling them uh, on the local meat market for sale mm. as, uh, 
as meat. Uh, that's yeah. another way that the virus could have escaped from the laboratory. Wow. Um, in addition to the idea of, of course, someone becoming infected due to poor lab protocol and then going out on mm -hmm. the street and mm -hmm. infecting others, right. it could have come by the vector of an infected animal sold to make a profit on the side. What about the World Health Organization, before I let you go? You trust their numbers in reporting on this? Uh, I, I do not trust the World Health Organization at all, and I will, I will tell you why. The head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, uh, was uh, China's candidate for that position. And China very generously bestowed an $850 million research, medical research center in the capital city of Ethiopia, where Dr. Tedros is from. So I think when Tedros, uh, Dr. Tedros got to China, he was already uh, a month and a half late. And when he came back from China on that first visit and he told us that everything is under control, the Chinese are doing a great job at controlling the spread of the coronavirus, he was, he was not telling the truth. He was simply repeating what the Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping told him. But let me say this also, Raymond. We have in the United States the best medical care system in the world. We are number one when it comes to dealing with threats like this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a flu. A virus. We right. deal with the flu every winter, right. and and we will get through this uh, by by finding cures for the disease, by finding a vaccine for the disease mm -hmm. quicker than anyone else in the world. This is not the Black Death. Yeah. This is a a flu epidemic. We can handle it. We're ahead of the curve, thanks to yeah. the president uh, banning flights from China. Uh, we're ahead of the curve, thanks to the vice president leading a great task force to deal with the problem on the ground throughout the United mm -hmm. States. We don't have the epidemic that Italy has. We don't have the epidemic that Iran has or other countries because right. we stopped the flights immediately. We're, we're, we're out of time, but I have to get one quick thing in. Jimmy Lai, the uh, media mogul uh, freedom fighter in Hong Kong, was arrested uh, this past week for illegal yeah. assembly uh, connected to a protest in Hong Kong. This is, now he could face five years in prison or more. Uh, he writes regularly for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's talked about the deception of China. Your thoughts on this? Should we be doing something? Should the United States be doing something to liberate Jimmy Lai? Well, we should. We should. We should recognize that Jimmy Lai may well, very, very well be. Jimmy Lai may very well be a prisoner of conscience in in a Hong Kong prison. Uh, at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party across the border, which wants him silenced. Uh, the other thing we should do is make it very clear to, to China and China's leaders that Hong Kong's special status will go away. It will disappear unless Hong Kong's economic and political system is left alone, as promised under the 50-year Sino-British agreement. Mm -hmm. If they continue violating that agreement, then all bets are off. We'll just consider Hong Kong to be another Shanghai, another Tianjin, and, uh, and, and that will hurt China's economy tremendously. Mm. Stephen Mosier, author of Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to the World Order, is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. Gary Krupp is next. But first, this important story. On Tuesday, the Vatican opened archives related to Pope Pius XII's pontificate. As historians and researchers began to scour some two million documents for information, most attention will be paid to what they reveal about Pius's actions and attitudes toward the Jewish people and the Nazis during the Second World War. Here now to discuss this historic release is the founder and president of the Pave the Way Foundation. He's one of the world's foremost experts on the pontificate of Pius XII and his actions during the Second World War. Please welcome back to the program Gary Krupp. Gary, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Raymond. I really appreciate it. Thank now, you. Now, Pope Francis allowed these archives to be opened eight years prior to what canon law dictates. Now, first off, tell me, why is this important in the wake of that play back in the 60s, the deputy, uh, the Cornwall book, uh, Hitler's Pope, vis-a-vis -vis the pontificate of Pius XII and his actions during World War II? Well, th this is a very, very important because, as you well know, everybody who lived through the war knew the actions of Pius XII and of the Holy See under his pontificate. And because of the Russian disinformation program, which started in February of 1960 uh, and actually culminated with the, in 1963 with the play The Deputy, and so when it started, an entire slew of things completely reversing 
the true history of what mm. happened. And this is the most disturbing thing, because you took a man who did so much good and so much saved so many lives, and, and to completely turn the world, world's opinion against him, this is a sin. It's a sin in Judaism, and it's a sin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in all, in all civilized uh, religions. And so were, it's very, who were the very, agents uh, of this? Before we move on to this new treasure trove of information, and I do want to move <coughs> to it, and I know you over many years have been collecting uh, information from archives all over the world, but who was interested in destroying the reputation of Pius XII and propagating this lie about it, him? It, was, it actually started with Joseph Stalin. And uh, because, as you know, uh, the Holy See and, and under the pontificate of Pius XII were very anti-communist. Mm -hmm. uh, and then continued with Khrushchev. And Khrushchev financed this with the KGB. And we know the entire story because we have, a, you know, Ron Rischlack, as you know, Ron no. wrote the book Disinformation right. with General Mihai Pesepa, who was the highest ranking KGB agent mm -hmm. ever to defect. And he very clearly lays out precisely how they did it. And, and, and all of the, the games they played. They mm. actually forged documents and so on and, and uh, pushed this, this agenda. It was, mm. it was terrible and very effective. Yeah. Very, very. It's effective to this very day. Well, Italian yeah. media is reporting of a document in the archives, in the Vatican archives, from the Vatican's press and information service. Now, it bears <coughs> Pius's handwriting in the margins. And uh, the, the, the note reads, or the, the document reads, uh, the, the, this is a, a dispatch from the Vatican's information office, quote, on the night of the 15th and 16th October, a considerable number of Jews were arrested in various parts of Rome. Stop. After being held 24 hours in the military college, were transported to an unknown destination. Stop. It is said that the Holy See was concerned that similar events should not be repeated and in favor of particular cases. And alongside that comment, Pius writes in his hand, is it prudent for the press service to send this news? What do you make of that? What does it tell you? Well, he tells us because the Vatican was operating all over Europe, actually, and far before the October 16th in saving Jewish lives. And they certainly did not want uh, the entire Nazi regime to know about this. It was so they, they really, you know, and we have a lot of different uh, documents that came up similar to this. Mm -hmm. We have one actually from with, with the um, American ambassador and the British ambassador were asking Pius XII not to speak out against the Nazi uh, and, and Hitler, the Nazi regime and Hitler, because it would have also meant that he would have had to speak out against the Russians. And that would have hurt the Allied movement. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of secret documents and things that went on. But we know very clearly that the actions that were taken by that, by Pius the Twelfth, and all over Europe, and monies that were sent to many different areas. Now you have to realize, you know, during our research, <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize this, but the documents that are in the secret archives are original documents, the copies of which are in many of the dioceses. So right. Pave the Way Foundation went to, we went to Campania, we went to Assisi, we went to to Vienna, mm -hmm. and we got. We, we got what we have maybe 4,000 wartime documents, and we've had them for years. And so, a lot of the researchers, quote unquote, historians, who really did not do a very good job researching this, really could have had access to a lot of this material before. Hmm. So, uh, so now, uh, 150,000 people have applied to access these archival documents. 150 people, sorry. Uh, only 60 can be accommodated in the offices at any one time. What do you think the process is going to look like? And do you expect any new answers, a smoking gun, if you will? Well, we, we've been getting some smoking guns, uh, like the one you just described, which is a very positive one. But um, the reason, first of all, the reason is there's a physical inability for them to do it. Meredith and I both have access to the secret archives, or what are now called the apostolic archives. And mm -hmm. we have access to the archives of the Secretary of State. And the procedures are bizarre. The Secretary of State archives are completely digitized, and you've got right. 24 computer terminals, much, much simpler. The, the original secret, or the, the papal, actually the papal archives, right. are done the same way as they've been done for centuries. Yeah, and they're all boxed very, up. They're on the split take... screen with you there, and you see them by year broken up. They're in boxes. They're, they're rather cumbersome to, to work their way through. Yeah, and you, and you can also only get four documents a day, and mm. you have to be there. So our director for Germany, Michael Hessman, who's an avid archival researcher, he's got, 30, he's got three weeks. He's been there, and I keep getting emails every day of mm. what they've discovered. 
And so he asked if I want, if I need copies of this and that. And I said, look, I'll give just a quick example. He called me, said they, they saw 1,100 documents of where, where Jews who were being in certain locations were writing to the Secretary of State for help. And then the responses. He says, do you need these documents? I said, actually, I've got 3,000 of those <laughs> from Campania. Exactly the same thing, where the Vatican was interceding to, to, to reunite families, to help uh, uh, Jews who were being persecuted and to, to get them stuff. So we've got a, we, 76,000 pages on our website yep. free for anybody to access. So wow. we have all this, plus the eyewitness interviews, which are priceless, because these people yep. are all gone now. Right. Uh, Martin, Sir Martin Gilbert and so on and, right. and, and so on. These are very, very incredible uh, piece of information. Yeah. No, I had him on the show. Uh, the American uh, Jewish Committee released a statement on Monday welcoming the opening of the Vatican Secret Archives, saying, quote, we trust that the independent scholarly review of these archival materials will provide greater clarity as to what positions and steps were taken during this period by the Holy See and help resolve the persistent debates and controversy in this regard. Such necessary transparency is also to the credit of the Church and will further enhance the mutual trust and excellent relations between the Catholic Church and the Jewish community built up over the last 55 years. What are you hearing from people in the Jewish faith, uh, Gary, uh, particularly those Again. in the Rome community? I hear the current chief rabbi of Rome yeah. is rather suspicious of any new information. He seems to have made up his mind about Pius. Well, he, he certainly has. I once had a, uh, an argument with him about this. Uh, we did, as you well know, we did a symposium uh, for three days in, actually, in the military college where the Jews were, were kept uh, in the Piazza Salviati, and uh -huh. we invited the Roman Jewish community to attend. He says, nobody's going to attend. I know. I researched this. I said, you researched this? You're steps away from the secret archives. Have you ever gone there? Also, and it's not just the secret archives. Most of the, certainly the information of the arrest of the Jews on October 16th, were not even there. They're in the archives of Santa Maria del Anima, the Austrian cathedral, mm -hmm. in which we've got documents which show precisely what happened that day and how Pius XII acted directly and personally to end the arrest of the Roman Jews at 2 o'clock the day it started. Wow. So This is in 1943, right? October 16, 1943. That's uh -huh. correct. And how do and we, we know, know that? exactly what happened that day. How do we, we know, know that? it? Because they, during, okay, we know it because we, in Santa Maria del Anima is the actual correspondence between uh, General Rainier Stahl, who was the, who was the uh, G German commander of Rome, and Pius XII's nephew, Carlo Pacelli, who was an official of the Vatican, and, and Pancratius Pfeiffer and so on. And the efforts that were made were... It, it, I could go into the reason why they, they, they ended the, the arrest at 2 o'clock that day, but because it was a military reason. Ah. The problem was that there was, and we have the actual documentation, which nobody acknowledges, about how General Karl Wolf was ordered by Adolf Hitler to invade the Vatican, mm. kidnap the Pope, take him to Liechtenstein where he'd be killed. Right. And he would, and, 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 but the German military knew that if this happened, there would be riots all over Europe. And they actually came out mm -hmm. and they said, and, and General Stahl had to call Heinrich Himmler on the phone. And we actually heard, uh, interviewed uh, uh, Father Gumpel, actually interviewed the, the person, General Dietrich Baylitz, mm -hmm. who heard the conversation, where he threatened Himmler. And he said, look, you, we need 384 troops to arrest the Roman Jews, which is not normally a problem. Right. However, the partisans are picking us off at night, and the Allies have full air superiority, and you're expecting me to supply the troops fighting down south. You have to accept responsibility for this. Mm -hmm. And so Himmler, not being a military man, backed off and said, for special purposes, the arrest will stop. That's why they stopped. And wow. so they used the threat that the Pope would speak out against the arrest to stop, to get the, the uh, Germans to stop the arrest. And that was very, very effective. It worked. And mm. then, as you well know, Pius XII issued verbal orders and written orders right. all over Europe to, to protect the Jews. And we actually have studies that of how many were Jews, where they were kept. I ha actually have the diary of a Augustinian nuns where they said that today we were asked by the Holy Father to, to, uh, to protect the Jews, and it names the people they took in. Yeah, and no, so it's amazing. There's so much evidence of the, and then plus the fact that the Pope has to lift cloister to allow m women to mm -hmm. go into monasteries and men to go into convents. Right, which he did. And so they ordered this protection. Right, he certainly yeah. did. And no, did, I. Incredible. 
Gary, I remember years ago yeah, interviewing ahead. nuns who were then in their 80s, uh, recounting how they would bring, they would come in the night, they'd knock on the door, and mothers and Jewish mothers and their children would come in. They would dress the women as nuns and hide the children right. away. And many times these convents were raided and they hid the families under the stage. And the nuns got on stage and pretended they were rehearsing some little drama, and then the Nazis went away. An amazing, dramatic saving of so many lives Every, here. How many lives do you estimate Pius XII well, might they have saved? saved? Say totally? Jewish totally, lives. The number is Jewish actually lives. rising. Well, Jewish lives totally, uh, the number is rising. It was th that during the war, the wartime, um, uh, an Israeli ambassador and, and historian, Pincus Lapita, mm -hmm. estimated that he saved 887,000 lives in Europe. Throughout the, under the pontificate. This number is rising now because there were many things that happened that he was unaware of. We happen to know about many of these, these life-saving efforts. So it's now closer to well over 900,000, which is today is 4 million Jews, which is also 25% of all the Jews alive. But there are only 16 million Jews wow. in the entire world. It's two, That's amazing. Two-tenths of 1% of the population. And so... It, it, and, the, and the problem, Raymond, as you, as you may, may be aware, is that in Judaism, and this was told to me by the chief rabbi of Israel, mm -hmm. the worst character flaw a Jew can have is ingratitude. It's in the Bible. Mm. When Moses had to strike mm. the Nile River, he couldn't do it. It would have shown ingratitude to right. the Nile, which gave him life. Mm. So there's a very important principle. So this Russian disinformation program robbed the Jewish people of the dignity of showing Gratitude to the entity, the church, the, 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 the Holy See, and this pope for saving their lives. Mm. This is a sin in Judaism. And the fact is, there are a lot of people who have to atone for that sin, that I believe. Before I let you go, should Yad Vashem really, yeah. recognize Pius XII as righteous among nations? Do you expect that as a result of the opening of these archives? I expect that that will happen. It happens that we submitted, Paved the Way Foundation submitted almost uh, six years ago, documents proving, and actually because he follows all of the rules of to be righteous mm -hmm. among nations, and we submitted to him, but they're really not even looking at them. They're pending this. Yad Vashem is very fair, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. You, they had that very terrible placard in, in the, in the uh, Hall of Shame I remember. And I saw in it. 2000, in two, yeah, and in 2012, they invited the Professor Napolitano and Andrea Tornielli to Jerusalem to have a conference and understand something, that we were sending hundreds of documents that we were discovering. They would not accept them from me. Yad Vashem would not take them from me. Mm -hmm. I sent them to then Archbishop Franco. I would email them to him. He would print them. He would hand deliver them to the director of Yad Vashem. And now they're finding all of this material. And then they effectively changed that placard. It's still negative, mm -hmm. but it's modified. And in mm -hmm. it, it says we're waiting for the archives to open. It's going to take years before right. we find all of this material. But the fact is, a lot of this has been out there, and people yep. have refused to look at it. Well, and the, I'm going to tell people, the, I want to tell people where they can find it, Gary, because you all have done incredible work over these years to collect from tiny archives, monasteries, uh, dioceses in far-flung parts of the world, information related to this still contested moment in history. And it's just an incredible bit of work that the Pave the Way Foundation has done. Gary Krupp, thank you for being here. This is the address on the website that you can find all of this information. It's ptwf.org, Pave the Way Foundation, right. ptwf.org. Gary Krupp, thank you for being here. We'll check in with you as we learn more from these archives. Oh, we're going to, but very quickly, you have to register to get to the pages because that's the property of the Holy See. And you have to agree that you're not going to be using this for commercial purposes and everybody can have full access to it free of charge. 76,000 pages. Love so it. we have that plus the interviews. Thank yeah. you, Gary. Raymond, thank you Talk so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you Thanks so much. Here. Take care now. Thank you. Yesterday, the Supreme Court heard arguments regarding a law in Louisiana that would require abortion doctors to have admitting privileges to local hospitals. Pro-life advocates of the law argue that the requirement protects women with emergency medical care in case of abortion complications. But abortion supporters argue the law is simply a way to make it more difficult for women seeking abortions to obtain them. Joining me now to discuss the law is its sponsor, pro-life Democrat and Louisiana State Senator Katrina Jackson. Thank you for joining us, Katrina. 
Oh, thanks for having me. Now, uh, I had, you guys have such beautiful weather in Washington. Oh, well, we're, we're, it's not too bad in Louisiana. I was there a few days ago. It's beautiful. Uh, and you're, you're joining us from Monroe. Now, four years ago, the Supreme Court struck down an, an almost identical law in the state of Texas. Why is this Louisiana law different from the Texas statute? Well, um, the Louisiana state interest is actually different. The law is crafted a little different, but our state interest is extremely different. Because in the state of Louisiana, for a number of years, we have required admitting privileges for physicians performing uh, any procedures in ambulatory surgical centers. And we also believe that it was a requirement for abortion facilities. But because Louisiana has a separate part of the law designated for abortion facilities, we didn't reference it. So it was actually a cleanup bill for the original intent of the uh, of the admitting privileges law, and it was different from Texas because Texas had Texas had never required admitting privileges in outpatient uh, facilities mm -hmm. that performed uh, any procedures. Louisiana has always thought it was paramount to the health and safety of its constituents that a physician have admitting privileges for a quick response if there was a complication during the procedure. Mm -hmm. And people have been asking, well, what is admitting privileges? When you break it down to the average person who doesn't practice medicine, who hasn't read this bill, is this, that if something happens while a, while a physician is performing an outpatient procedure on you, that that physician has admitting privileges with a hospital, which means he or she can pick up the phone and call and say, listen, I'm sending patient A. I'm sending them by ambulatory uh, transport or by uh, car. This is what happened, and this is what we need you to do. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. But when you think about in the area of reproductive health for women, right, it's extremely important because there's a few scenarios that happen, uh, complications when a woman is having an abortion. Her wound can be punctured right. or she could begin to hemorrhage. You have a very short window of time to correct this issue before, number one, the woman requires a hysterectomy, and number two, before she's not able to ever have children again. And so you're talking about doctors receiving admitting privileges so that they can be in contact with a hospital within close proximity if something happened. So some people have said, you know, what's different? That's what's different about Louisiana, mm -hmm. is but that our, our state has always shown an interest yeah, the, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court is hearing this case, and the defense claim, look, you've only got two doctors in the state that would be able to meet this law's requirements, and therefore, this will unduly burden the women seeking an abortion. How would you respond to that argument? Well, when we first started the case, they said it was only one doctor, because there was only one doctor with admitting privileges. Mm -hmm. Since that time, what we found was that no doctor, the testimony during our legislative hearings is that no doctor besides that one doctor had applied for admitting privileges. Second, since this case has started, two others have applied for admitting privileges. Uh, one was granted them, and one applied to a Catholic hospital, although there was a hospital that had granted admitting privileges to the other physician in this case. Mm -hmm. He didn't apply there. And so what I've said to people is that it's not that they couldn't receive admitting privileges, it's that they didn't care to receive admitting privileges. And at some point, once the second doctor received, it, received admitting privileges, the rest of them didn't apply because it would have made their, their case moot and their argument of no validity. Mm -hmm. And so what I feel that's happening right now is or, in order not to meet the requirements of this law, these doctors are not applying for admitting privileges. They didn't before because the law required it for every other doctor but those performing abortions. And so that's how I've responded. And, and, and lastly, it's this is that in a time of emergency, a woman wants a quick response. Anyone does. Mm -hmm. I really feel, and I've said this uh, in interviews before, is that if I had regulated an area of vasectomies, I wouldn't have been criticized. Mm. And everyone would have been standing up saying that makes sense. Well, we have to hold doctors to the same standard of care when we look at reproductive health of women. Mm -hmm. And so that's been my response. If you don't want to take care of the women in time of complication, if you don't want to maximize to the fullest your ability to take care of them, right, then don't perform abortions. Don't mm -hmm. do anything in our state because Louisiana has a long history of protecting its patients against mm -hmm. doctors who do things and can't take care of their patients. Mm -hmm. 
Madam lastly, Senator, I told them this, I, I'm, is that I, I'm, we, all, Madam, I'm sorry, I, just, yeah. I get so passionate about this. I love that. No, I love your passion. <laughs> Look, Madam Senator, before I run out of time, uh, I need to tell you about this. As you know, the composition of the Supreme Court has changed with the two Trump appointees, Gorsuch and, and uh, Kavanaugh, are now on the court. Kennedy sided with the majority last time that Texas uh, law, which was very similar to this one, was heard. That may change the outcome here, how the court rules. At a, a rally yesterday outside the Supreme Court, New York Senator Chuck Schumer addressed the crowd. He said this to the new justices. Watch. I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. Mm. Now, Mr. Schumer said he, he used the wrong words and he apologized for that. Your reaction to that statement? I definitely think he used the wrong words. What he did and what his statement was, and, and the, even using the wrong words, was to incite something against these justices that somehow uh, allows his supporters and his followers to believe that it's okay to retaliate against the justices based on them doing their job. As elected officials, we never, never have the right, nor is it, nor is it proper, to ever say those words. Uh, when I first became a pro-life Democrat, when I first filed my first legislation, I had it to happen to me with an employee of Planned Parenthood. Mm. And, and let me tell you what it does, so that legislators and others are very sensitive. I couldn't go in and out of the city of New Orleans for a while without a police escort mm. in a state that I'm elected in, because someone said that any support of abortion should knock me over the head if they saw me. Oh. People take this seriously. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful with our words. So I'll admonish any elected official to be very careful with your word because people respect you and they will follow what you say. Mm -hmm. Before I let you go, you are an endangered species. You just mentioned you're a pro-life Democrat. And among Democratic presidential candidates, uh, it's clear they really don't have much room for pro-life Democrats in the party. Is that stance going to hurt Democrats on the national level, in your opinion? Yes, it will. And I'm praying that at some point, because there are some candidates who really want to help people in the same way we do in other areas, that they come forward and realize that the Democratic Party is the, par the party of the big tent, which means we are the party of diverse ideas, and that they come back to the center of this thing and begin to welcome pro-life Democrats back to the party. I would say that if they don't, they lose a large segment of the Democratic Party when you realize that one out of every three Democrats is pro-life. Wow. I did not know that. Senator Katrina Jackson, I thank you so much for being here. We could yeah. talk all day. We'll do it again soon, I hope. Yes, most definitely. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Well, Lent has already begun, but how can we and our families really experience Lent and the Easter season to its fullest? My next guest has some tips for you on how you can do that. His new book, Celebrating a Holy Catholic Easter, a guide to the customs and devotions of Lent and the season of Christ's resurrection, is a roadmap to get us on the right track. Welcome back to the program, Father William Saunders. Great to see Good you. Good to see you again, Raymond. Now, tell me, why did you decide to do this book? Last year, or a couple right. of years ago, I had you on, you had the Celebrating Merry Catholic Christmas. Exactly. Now you've got Celebrating a Holy Catholic Easter. Were these planned as a duo? They were, sort of. Okay. But after the Christmas book, many people said you ought to do something for Lent and Easter. Mm -hmm. And the, same, the rationale is the same, that we live in this secular pagan culture. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted people to have an easy access to the great traditions of our church. Mm -hmm. I want families to be able to live the faith and instill that Catholic culture in their homes. Mm -hmm. This is what we need. You know, when our Holy Father, Pope St. John Paul II, God rest his soul, talked about the domestic church. We need that today, mm -hmm. and this is a way to help build that. Yeah, well, I, I love that it, it not only gives you the backstory of things we take for granted, exactly. but there new there'll be new traditions here to some people, and it, it shakes us out of the secularity of, oh, well, here comes Easter, and that's the right. Easter bunny and the Easter eggs, and it's yes. one day, and then it's over. There is this Lenten season that precedes it. Exactly. Why, are, why are those 40 days so important? And why do we miss them so often? Well, it's important because we need that period of renewal. Mm -hmm. Lent is really very intense. The idea of the prayer, fasting, almsgiving is essential. 
of course, the idea of making the good confession, and I have a great examination of conscience. Mm. There really is that idea of we're ashes. You know, we get mm -hmm. we start off yeah. with ashes, and people come out of the woodwork at church for ashes. Yeah. But it reminds us of our mortality, our woundedness, mm. and that we really need a savior. Yeah. But that's what Lent's about to come back to Jesus and receive that Savior. I always look for the, the touchstones of things that we take for granted in the world today. Mm -hmm. And in this book, you do a great uh, service of connecting them back to this Lent, mm -hmm. Easter, and the church tradition, the origins of things like right. what you identify as the official food and drink of this Lent, which is what and why? Beer and pretzels. Beer and, and pretzels. Everybody loves that chapter. But the tradition is that about the year 600, a monk was making some kind of a spread for Lent. Yeah. Now, in those days, fasting was strict. No meat, dairy products, eggs. So it was tough. Bread and water, basically. So it was pretty much yeah. bread and water, and it was bread without milk, so it was sort of plain bread. So he was making like what would be a pretzel, or not a pretzel, oh, oh. A, a, a bread stick, a bread mm -hmm. stick, and he's rolling it out. And he thought, well, let's make a shape. So he thought of how we pray sometimes and the two crossed arms. So he twisted the dough and there you have the pretzel. Now this would be the soft Philly version of a pretzel. Right. But then there's another tradition that in the 1400s, a monk overslept as he is baking the pretzels and they became hard, huh. but they were good. So there you have pretzel. And actually the pretzel comes from pretziola, which means the little prayerful little arms. Prayerful arms, wow. So, now, the beer. Yeah, where did the beer, how does the beer fit into well, that? I want to, you, you, you pub visitors, now, pay attention to this. Now, according to the Polliner Brewing Company okay. that bought the monastery that started this tradition wow. in Germany, apparently they needed a good, hearty beverage. They, did, they gave up wine, mm -hmm. and so beer has carbohydrates, some protein, lots of good electrolytes, there you have it. Antioxidants, Antioxidants, you say in the book? That's right. So beer and pretzels. Beer and, and you pretzels. can lose weight with beer and pretzels if you keep it all Lent. Really? Yeah. So no. go, I don't know if it's vegan or not, but go vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight I'm going to have a big Lenten <laughs> celebration, right. Father. This is a very New yeah. Orleanian approach. I like this. Yeah. I, could, I yeah. can buy into this. Tell us about hot cross buns, which you also talk about in the book. Well, hot cross buns. Where did buns, they come from? How do they fit into Well, Lenten again, history? this is more of a British tradition, but uh -huh. they were to mark Good Friday, so they had a bread, and then they would make the cross on top of them. The, they were filled with usually fruit of some kind, like a canned, like a red fruit to remind us of our Lord's blood, or even raisins to remind us of the grape and the wine, sort of a Eucharistic mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. theme. So that was just a little hot cross bun. Wow. But that's a great tradition. So on Good Friday, you could have, again, you're fasting, but you could have something and it was something special to help you remember Good Friday. Wow, I love that. I love those touchstones. And again, things you can practice, you can make with the kids, you can right. take part in it. It becomes a reoccurring, and the, the smells, the tastes yeah. of a season, right. those are the things you remember going right. forward into adulthood yeah. and beyond. And it's so wonderful being a Catholic because even during Lent, you have St. Joseph's Solemnity and Annunciation Solemnity, so mm -hmm. you can have a free day. Yeah. And St. Joseph's Day. <laughs> and Sundays. And Sundays, too, technically. <laughs> okay. And so, but St. Joseph's Day, there's a tradition of having the St. Joseph's table. Right. You can have goodies and a festivity. Mm -hmm. There's a prayer service. Now, in our parish, we do that yeah. officially. But if you don't have that in your parish, you could do it as a family. No, we, we have all those great St. Joseph yeah. altars in New Orleans. That exactly. Are, you know, productions. Mm -hmm. and, they are. And parades and the whole nine yards. So it's exactly. quite a, it's, and the, yeah. th those are basically Sicilian traditions. They are. It comes from Sicily. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, I, I want to talk about, in the book, you dedicate this book to your dear mother. Yes. Um, and this was her favorite yes. holiday. Yes. Why and how did her love of Easter affect you? What was well, Easter and Lent like growing up? Well, Lent was very real. So in the sense that we all gave up something for Lent, we did our, in those days, you had the abstinence mm -hmm. from fish on Fridays. Right. Then also we did our Stations of the Cross. We went to confession. So my mother is very good about making sure Lent was this prayerful season. And then Easter, or not Easter, yeah, Easter was just a celebration. Now we mm -hmm. did the whole Triduum. Right. We did that. And then, but Easter was special. We had our new outfits. Mm. And then we always had the ham 
the special Easter yeah. eggs, I remember yeah. dyeing those. And then also the upside down cake, oh, pineapple yeah. upside down cake, yeah. which was special because for, in our family tradition, you bake it upside down, but it flips out. And Jesus came into an upside down world oh. to turn it right side up. Mm. And the little pineapple reminds us of the sun, yeah. the resurrection, yeah. and the red cherry, the sacred heart of Jesus. Wow. So that's our tradition. I love that. Yeah. Uh, who do you want to read this book? What do you want them to take away from it? I would like really everyone. One, it's for priests to help us with preaching because mm -hmm. you could bring a lot of these into your preaching or teaching, but then families. Mm -hmm. I would hope young parents especially would read this book so that they can hand on these traditions, like start them now, but so that their kids have this Catholic culture mm -hmm. that they grow up in, that they take to heart, and then they'll pass on. Mm -hmm. In our world, we're fighting the battle. And so the home has to have that Catholic culture. Yeah, and prayer, fasting, almsgiving. That's the flavor that's, that's of this season. That that's is. really what the book's about. It ways is. to do that, ways to encounter that, ways to enrich that and deepen mm -hmm. it. Um, before I let you go, as a pastor, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're dealing with this coronavirus threat. Yes. Right. Um, you, you, were, uh, you have a large suburban parish in right. northern Virginia. I knew it well. Yes, you um, did. You were there for but, many years. But it's also a very cosmopolitan place. A lot it of is. people from around the world. What are you doing? Are there any preventative measures you're taking moving into that season? Some people, for instance, are doing away with the, the precious blood right. at, at Mass. No right. cup being offered. Right. Well, we've never done that at Our Lady right. of Hope because my mom, the nurse, always said you pass germs that way. So we've never. <laughs> you can That's why I sat behind your mother every That's Sunday exactly. and loved it. She knew what she was doing. That's right. So you know, I've just told people if you feel sick, a cold, whatever, stay home. Mm. Don't share your germs. Mm -hmm. So right now, that's about the only preventative measure. I think mm -hmm. our news media likes to hype this a yeah, little bit. I agree. More people have died of the flu this year. And will. And yeah. will than the coronavirus. So I tell people, use your good sense. A lot of hand washing. Mm -hmm. I do after every mass, finish shaking hands, mm -hmm. wash hands. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good, prudent practice. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, reportage, even in the Catholic world, about, uh, you know, people, they say, well, you should, perhaps giving communion in the hand no. might be more hygienic. No. Is it? No, you have more germs on your hand. Good old mom, the nurse, said this too. Uh -huh. More germs on your hand than you do on the tongue. Wow. And the priest probably is not going to hit your tongue. No. That's very unusual. No, they're, no, most priests are really good about it. You're, you're well trained That's to right. kind of yeah. pop and drop. <laughs> we also know who's, you know, you, you know the problem children in the parish. Too. Yes, that's right. You got to watch. The snappers. Yeah, the snappers. Got to watch yeah. that. Anyway, Father, thank you so much for the thank book you. Celebrating a Holy Catholic Easter in Bookstores Everywhere A Guide to the Customs and Devotions of Lent yeah. and the Season of Christ's Resurrection by Father William Saunders. It's available everywhere, including EWTN's religious catalog at EWTNRC.com. Thank you, Father. Great. Great Thank to you. see you. Good Thank you. you. Before we go, on March 24th, the paperback edition of Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, will be hitting bookstores. All three Will Wilder books will then be in paperback, perfect for the adventurer in your home on the go. And all three books are also available as audiobooks or on Audible. Go to RaymondArroyo.com or to your favorite bookseller and get them all. That's all the time we have for this week. Next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the crew and staff of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.